Basal ganglia is an important structure of the brain that is essential for coordinating movements. And so it's sometimes referred to as extra pyramidal nervous system as it's able to modulate the corticospinal nervous system. Now here I have a coronal section of the brain and with the exception of the thalamus which is this green structure shown right here, the rest of the structures that I'm showing you in color are part of the basal ganglia. And I'm going to go over the anatomy of the basal ganglia, which you will have to be familiar with. And so you will have to be able to name the structures that are listed here. So first, starting with the caudate. So this is the caudate nucleus. And caudate nucleus has a C-shaped structure. So what happens when we obtain a coronal section of this caudate nucleus, two part of it will be cut. And so here I'm showing you the upper part of it, also known as body of the caudate nucleus. And then here on the lower part, this other yellow structure is also caudate nucleus, but it's the tail. Then we have the putamen, which is this blue structure. And then the orange and the pink structure I've shown here is globus pallidus. And then globus pallidus is divided into two parts. The external part, which is shown in orange color, and so it's known as globus pallidus externus, or GPE. And then the internal part, which is shown in pink color, and that is known as globus pallidus internus, or GPE. I. The other structure that we have here and shown in green, these two structures that are shown in green, are subthalamic nuclei. And the reason the name subthalamic nucleus is given to it is, is that sub means under. So this nucleus is located under the thalamus. So therefore it's called subthalamic nucleus. And then finally we have the substantia nigra and so substantia means substance and nigra means black so the fact that this structure has a black color it, the name substantia nigra is given to it and so this structure is actually responsible for producing dopamine and so patients with Parkinson's disease which have destruction of substantia nigra have low levels of dopamine in these brain structures alright now just to review the anatomy one more time so here we have the caudate nucleus, which is divided into body and tail. So body on the top, tail at the bottom. We have putamen. We have globus pallidus, which is divided into globus pallidus externus and globus pallidus internus. Then we have the subthalamic nucleus, which is located right under the thalamus. And then we have the substantia nigra. Now there are some other terminologies that you will have to be familiar with. And it's that the caudate and putamen together are referred to as striatum and that putamen and globus pallidus together are referred to as lentiform nucleus and then the final structure is the internal capsule which is the structure the brain structure that is in between the caudate putamen and thalamus so the structure right here is the internal capsule which contains the fibers that are going into and out of the cerebral cortex. All right, now there are two types of neurons that will communicate between the basal ganglia structures and these are the excitatory neurons which will release glutamate to activate neurons and then the inhibitory neurons which will release GABA to inhibit the function of other neurons. So next, I would like to go over the function of basal ganglia and explain how basal ganglia can control movements. So here I have shown the uh, excitatory neurons with the positive circle and then the inhibitory neurons with a negative circle. So generally, thalamus is being negatively regulated by globus pallidus internus. So therefore, the default programming of the brain is that there shouldn't be any movements. And then there are two different pathways that can determine how to change the um, activity of the thalamus so that whether there would be more movements or whether there should be less movement. So the direct pathway, which is also known as excitatory pathway, will enhance the function of thalamus to induce movement.
So therefore, the excitatory path pathway increases movement. And this pathway is shown on the top. And so you will have to ignore the lower part. And that's the reason I have shown it in the light gray. And then we have the indirect pathway, which is the inhibitory pathway. So the way you can memorize it is that in direct pathway is the inhibitory pathway. So now here we have this other pathway that is the inhibitory pathway. And so the function of the indirect pathway is to decrease movement by negatively regulating the activity of thalamus. So here, um, GPI is negatively regulating thalamus. So if we increase the activity of GPI, therefore there would be less movements. So subthalamic nucleus provides positive feedback to GPI, which will decrease movement. And then striatum, by negatively regulating GPE, which itself negatively regulates subthalamic nucleus, will have a positive effect on subthalamic nucleus. So the outcome of uh, indirect pathway is that the striatum will positively regulate subthalamic nucleus as a consequence of which it will positively regulate GPI and GPI will inhibit movement. With the other pathway, striatum will negatively regulate GPI and so it will interfere with the inhibition of thalamus. So therefore now there would be increased movement. And if you want me to provide you a lifelike example, the direct pathway is like the gas pedal while the indirect pathway is like the brake. So here we have the direct pathway and as the direct pathway is activated, there would be increased movement. So the car will start to move. But then if you activate the indirect pathway, it's like as if you're pushing the brake and so therefore uh, the car will stop. So the indirect pathway will decrease movement. And so that's what I just told you here. The indirect pathway decreases movement while the direct pathway increases movement. So now you can see that hypokinetic Disorders, like for instance Parkinson disease, are due to the decreased activity of the direct pathway. While the hyperkinetic disorders, like for instance uh, Huntington disease and hemibalismus, when there, where there is uncontrolled movement of the extremities, there is decreased function of indirect pathway. So the brake is not working and these patients cannot control the movements of their arms. Now in any case, let's now review the Parkinson, Huntington, as well as the hemibalismus disorders now that we know how the uh, direct and the indirect pathways are working. So here I have put the direct and indirect pathways together. So the substantia nigra of the uh, brain will release the dopamine neurotransmitters which can act on D1 receptors to activate the direct pathway of striatum. So the D1 um, dopamine receptors by activating the direct pathway will increase movement. On the other hand, the D2 dopamine receptors, by inhibiting the indirect pathway of the striatum, they would again increase movement. So normally, the indirect pathway will decrease movement. So the D2, by inhibiting the indirect pathway, will increase movement. And so this is the indirect pathway. And so you can see that the D2, by inhibiting the um, indirect pathway, will again increase movement. So now you can see that the function of substantia nigra, by releasing the dopamine, is to increase movement via both pathways. So uh, D1 activated direct pathway, while D2 inactivated the indirect pathway. Now, what happens if there is problem with substantia nigra? So if substantia nigra is being destroyed, which is the case in Parkinson disease. So now the dopamine receptors are not working because there is no more dopamine that is in substantia nigra. As a consequence of which the direct pathway cannot be activated. So we can no longer push the gas pedal. And then the indirect pathway cannot be inhibited. So we cannot stop from pushing the brake. So all that we will get is decreased movement with the Parkinson disease. So that's why that patients with Parkinson are presenting with bradykinesia, which is slow movement. Now with that information in mind, I would like to quickly summarize the feature of Parkinson disease. So Parkinson disease is due to the loss of dopaminergic neurons in subs 
Tansha Nagra. And it's from the accumulation of Lewy bodies, which are composed of the alpha synuclein protein. Now, there are also drugs that can cause destruction of substantia nigra, and one important example is the MPTP, which stands for methylphenyl tetrahydropyridine. Now, as for clinical features of Parkinson's disease, these patients present with resting tremor. And by resting tremor, what I mean is that there would be tremor only at rest. But when there is purposeful movement of the hands, like for instance, when the patient is trying to grab onto an object, then that's the time that the tremor will go away. There is also brady kinesia, which means there is a slowness of the movement. These patients present with rigidity, where there is increased resistance on passive movement of the extremities. So if you ask the patient to relax and try to move their arms, you will notice that there is some um, uh, resistance to the movement. And then the other term that is used to describe rigidity in these patients is cog will rigidity. And the reason for that is that there is kind of like the ratchety pattern of resistance and relaxation. So as you're trying to move the extremities, you will notice that it will let go and relax, but then it would uh, uh, start to resist. And then let go, relax, start to resist. So there is this ratchety pattern of resistance and relaxation. And so sometimes they refer to as cogwheel rigidity for Parkinson's disease. And then the final feature is the postural instability as well as the shuffling gait. So patients with Parkinson's disease are at increased risk of falls and due to the fact that these patients have a feeling of imbalance they're usually having a bent forward posture as well as flexed elbows. The next disorders are the Huntington and Hemibalismus which are the hyperkinetic movements and so hyperkinetic movements are due to the lesion of the indirect pathway so the brake is no longer working and so the patient cannot stop the movements and so Hemibalismus is due to the lesion of the subthalamic nucleus where patients are presenting with flailing of extremities that is unilateral. So now you know that subthalamic nucleus was feeding the GPI as a consequence of which it would inhibit the function of thalamus. Now if the subthalamic nucleus is no longer working, therefore the brake is no longer working because GPI is no longer being um, activated by the subthalamic nucleus. And so the patient cannot stop flailing the arms. And then a similar condition applies to the Huntington disease where there is lesion of striatum as a consequence of which the indirect pathway is no longer working. So what's happening here is that the brake is no longer working so the patient cannot co control the movements as a consequence of which there would be chorea which means that there is a rapid random movements. Now Huntington disease is an autosomal dominant disorder that is due to the expanded uh, CAG trinucleotide repeats and this CAG trinucleotide repeats are located on chromosome 4. So the memory aid that I have for you so that you know which chromosome is affected for the Huntington disease is hunt for food. So Huntington disease is due to the increased CAG trinucleotide repeats on chromosome number 4. As a consequence of which it will cause degeneration of the striatum and so the indirect pathway can no longer uh, work and so the brake is not working and so these patients present with chorea. And then another important feature of Huntington disease is anticipation. And what it means is that children of male patients who have Huntington disease are more likely to develop the um, disease at an early age. So it's anticipated to develop the disease at an early age. And the reason for that is that during spermatogenesis if the CAG repeats usually increase in size. And so as the CAG repeats become longer, therefore the severity of the disease will increase and thus the age of onset would be earlier. So therefore all this started with spermatogenesis. So that's the reason that children of the male patients who have Huntington disease are anticipated to have the disease at an early age. So an example would be that the father had symptoms of chorea at age 60 and then the child 
uh, had um, had the symptoms at around like let's say age uh, 45 or 50 so that's an event where we say there has been anticipation for the disorder to happen earlier all right now that we are done with the review of all these three disorders I would like to go over different forms of stroke and explain why these type of strokes are associated with hemi balismus so here I have an example of lacunar stroke where due to hypertension there would be arteriolosclerosis as a consequence of which the perfusion of these vessels the um, lenticulostriate arteries wouldn't be as good and so there would be infarction of the brain and it's usually the basal ganglia that would be affected so here I'm having an example of lacunar infarct for you where you can see that the basal ganglia can be affected due to the um, hypertension. Alternatively, the hypertension can cause rupture of the chakra bouchard aneurysms, which are again in the same perforating arteries than, that are coming off of the middle cerebral artery. And so this type of hemorrhage is again more commonly affecting the basal ganglion. So hypertension, either by causing the rupture of the aneurysm or by causing the arteriolosclerosis can cause either the ischemic stroke or the hemorrhagic stroke both of which are commonly affecting the basal ganglia and so here is another example that shows you the hemorrhagic stroke affecting the basal ganglia and so if the subthalamic nucleus of the basal ganglia is affected these patients would present with hemibalismus all right, now that we are done with the discussion of this topic, next I would like to tell you how Parkinson's disease is being treated by the stimulation of basal ganglia. So it's unlikely that this, the information I'm providing you here will show up on the examination, but since that now you know how the basal ganglia is working, it would be nice for you to know how the um, surgical techniques are used to stimulate basal ganglia to help improve the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. So you know how with the Parkinson's disease, there is decreased level of D1 as a consequence of which there would be increased activity of GPI. In addition, there is decreased activity of D2 as a consequence of which via the indirect pathway there would be increased activity of subthalamic nucleus. And subthalamic nucleus provides positive feedback to GPI, which again pushes the brake hard and so the patient cannot move. So for the Parkinson's disease, what you notice is that both GPI and subthalamic nucleus are having elevated activity. So one technique that is used to treat patients with Parkinson is via deep brain stimulation surgical techniques. And what they do is that they would place electrodes inside the brain that are acting on the globus pallidus internus or the subthalamic nucleus. And what these electrodes do is that they would decrease the function of these nuclei. So they would provide signals that would inhibit these nuclei. And so by inhibiting these nuclei, there would be now more movement and so this is one of the advanced techniques that are now used for the treatment of patients with Parkinson's disease. And that concludes our discussion of the basal ganglia.